Good evening, everyone. <laughs> we are going to be in Judges. We're going to move tonight. We're really going to cover some ground. Um, as you know, I've got 45 minutes to do all this, so we're going to be efficient to stay as efficient as we have been. Uh, we're going to start with Judges chapter 10, uh, and right off the bat, within four verses, we're going to cover two whole Judges. So let's get started here. Number one. After Abimelech, there arose to save Israel Tola, the son of Pua, the son of Dodo, a man of Issachar. And he dwelt in Shamir in the mountains of Ephraim. Now, sometimes we have challenging family trees, but this guy definitely had some challenges in his family tree. Tola, the son of Pua, the son of Dodo, um, he judged Israel for 23 years, and he died and was buried in Shamir. And then, after him arose Jair, a Gileadite, and he judged Israel 22 years. Now he had 30 sons who rode on 30 donkeys. They also had 30 towns, which are called Havoth Jair, tent villages, which are in Jair. That's the meaning of the name. To this day, which are in the land of Gilead, and Jair died and was buried in Canaan. And that's it. That's the whole story of Tola and Jair. Um, and, you know, sometimes we have that. And sometimes people refer to them as minor judges. And really, what if they weren't minor judges? What if they just didn't have the same kind of problems we see with the other judges? You know, like th there's no reason why Tola and Jair, Jair need to have any kind of less significance. They just don't have the same kind of... Um, stories that we're familiar with, but the Lord knows their faithfulness. The Lord knows what's been done when no one else knows. And I think that matters. And I think that's why they're referenced here. Um, and, and so we do have like a, a major um, judge that we're going to be looking at tonight in Jephthah. But the major judges, they have major challenges too. So just a little bit of credit where it's due right here for these guys. Um, with verse 6, it says, Then the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals and Ashtaroths, the gods of Syria, the gods of Sidon, the gods of Moab, the gods of the people of Ammon, the gods of the Philistines, and they forsook the Lord and did not serve him. So, yeah, we're, we're kind of back on track. It's almost like sometimes when you have like that, I don't know, like let's say a Rocky movie or something like that, and you're like, hmm, I wonder who's going to win in this one. You know, in the book of Judges, as we start new chapters, as we get to new areas, we kind of have that same situation. Hmm, I wonder how Israel's going to handle their faithfulness from the last judge to the next judge. And remember, if you can, that this is about a perfect kind of scenario in the sense that they're in the land of milk and honey. The Lord has intended for them to be delivered from all of their enemies. They should have total and absolute freedom, all of the resources that they'll ever need, God fighting their battles for them. Everything should really be wonderful, but sometimes without leadership, without good leadership, things go awry. And so we have all these different deities of this land of Canaan that they ended up giving up God for. And that's kind of interesting because it's not like, you know, sometimes we might try to make a decision. As a man, I, like every other man out there, when I need to make a decision, I make a spreadsheet, and I make you know pros and cons of whatever it is the decision needs to be made of. And it's not like they were saying, all right, so we have Jehovah, and here's the pros with Jehovah, and here's the cons with Jehovah. But then over here, there's Baal. Pfft, boy, the pros, the pros are really outweighing the cons on this one. It's not like there's that kind of thing going on. So we have all these different references to the different gods of different peoples, and, and, and even not even just one god, but many gods. And it's not because that they're really just tipping the scales of prose and truth, goodness. But we get infected by things that are foreign. Like our flesh just has this nature that is drawn towards the things that also reside in darkness. And I say also because I don't think that it's, I, I think that those things we find attraction to as we ourselves are tempted into it. 
I don't think that as the light exposes darkness that you know, there's, there's anything attractive of it in the truth of seeing things as God intends us to see things. But as we're not in that place, as we're not in the place of truth and light, um, other things become attractive that shouldn't be. Verse 7 says, So the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. And we're going to see something here in this in this series of verses that we've never seen in the book of Judges before. So he sells them into the hands of the Philistines and into the hands of the people of Ammon. So the Ammonites are going to, they're going to be one of our focuses here this evening. From that year, they harassed and oppressed the children of Israel for 18 years. So a generation. All the children of Israel who were on the other side of the Jordan in the land of the Amorites and Gilead. Let me see. Okay, good. So with this slide right here, um, basically what we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna look at right here, here's the Jordan right here, and we have a lot of our focus going on on this region over here. This is not the main area of Israel. The primary area of Israel where all the tribes are and everything are on this side of the Jordan, but we do have some tribes and people of Israel that remain over here in Gilead and, and some other places. Now, so the Lord is going to come in from the east on this one and start to wreak havoc on Israel. Moreover, verse 9 says, The people of Ammon crossed over the Jordan to fight against Judah, also against Benjamin, and against the house of Ephraim. So now those aren't really high up here on this list. Those are going to be further down here. So that's exactly what we see right here with this little uh, line that's orange. We have the people coming over and dealing with Benjamin here, going down, dealing with Judah, and dealing with Ephraim up here. Now, that may not seem like a very big line. It's even got some dashes in it and stuff. But whatever was going on with this invasion, it says that Israel was severely distressed. So I'm not trying to make light of it. It is what it is. It's a serious situation in its own right. And it's seriously oppressing Israel. And the children of Israel cried out to the Lord saying, We have sinned against you because we have both forsaken our gods and served the Baals. Now, I personally see this as two problems, not just one problem. It's one thing to forsake God. It's another thing to serve God other gods. And I kind of look at this, and we know that the, the fornication is a word that's used a lot when it comes to idol worship. And I think it would be kind of similar to a spouse maybe losing love for their significant other compared to a, lo- a spouse that's losing that love, forsaking the one that they're married to, but then having a relationship illicitly with another. And the reason why that's just worse is because all the things that they were meant to use and to have and to serve and to love, the energy, the spirit, the sacrifices, all those things that should be there in their proper place, they are there, but they're in the wrong place. And and I think that just makes things worse. And what Israel's doing now with this quote that we have in front of us here is they're coming to the Lord after 18 years as the last resort of their problems. Their last resort. And we'll see that in the verses to come here. But guys, it's been said before that Prayer should be the first thing that we do, not the last thing that we do. And and I'll I'll just tell you guys right now, like that's that's one of those challenging things for me. Um, sometimes when I pray, I immediately just think of what I need to do next, and I start moving before I really spend that time with God and sit in and enjoy that relationship and that communion to maybe have that time to cry out where the relationship that I have with him and the dependence that I have with him is not just I'm, I'm rubbing my hands on some genie in a bottle, but the relationship with God that is 
is more important than whatever circumstances that we're going through. So these guys come to a place where they finally reach out to God. Now, verse 11, this is, like I said, the Lord's going to show them some stuff here. The Lord said to the children of Israel, did I not deliver you from the Egyptians? I'm just going to read it. Amorites, Ammonites, Philistines, Sidians, Amalekites, and Maonites. Seven different groups here. Verse 13, yet you have forsaken me and served other gods. Therefore, I will deliver you no more. Go and cry out to the gods which you have chosen. Let them deliver you in your time of distress. So this is a, this is a place that we've seen God a little bit fed up now. This is um, in the Hebrew, it's called miffed. Like he's miffed. He's really at that point. This is a scary place. We know that God has all the patience we know that God has all time, and he knows how these things are going to play out. But I think, I think that this kind of distress that we're seeing here, this kind of language that's being reflected back on them, is, number one, it's due to his love for them. It's because he loves them, and also due to the rejection. They've rejected God. They've gone to these other gods, and God's like, fine, <laughs> okay, fine. You've trusted in all these other things. Let them save you. Verse 15 says, And the children of Israel said to the Lord, We have sinned due to us whatever seems best to you. Only deliver us this day, we pray. So important, verse 16, So they put away the foreign gods from among them and served the Lord and his soul could no longer endure the misery of Israel. I want to just say something quickly here. We saw with the book of Gideon, or the story of Gideon, that um, the Lord, before Gideon began his calling, the Lord called Gideon to cut down the foreign gods from among his house. Take those things out. Before you even get started, begin at home and take those things out. Now, Israel, we see in order to move forward with verse 16, they put these things away that were among them, these foreign gods. And I do think that this falls into the category of bearing fruits of repentance. We can say we're sorry, but sorry really like is the, one of those words that gets used a lot and at this point can be really lacking meaning, especially when... Uh, You've got, you know, siblings, and the parent says, now, apologize to your sister. That's one of those really questionable, sincere apologies. Um, but real repentance is turning. And if a person really is repenting, again, repentance is not based off of works. Repentance is of the heart, and for us to turn from whatever it is that was a violation of who we are and what we are, and to go into the direction. Like, I, I really look at it and explain it as like, it's a U-turn, it's a 180. I'm no longer going down this road. Because I know for kids, it can be one of those situations where, you know, uh, your kid is doing something wrong and they get in trouble and they go, sorry, I won't do it again. And they just kind of wait till they leave the room and then they go do it again. And that's not sorry. That's not repentance. But repentance is a turning from that, not to go back. It's, it's leaving that in the past. Israel is making the right decision. They're, they're, they're not just asking God for, for help, but they're putting these things out of their life now. Then the people of Ammon gathered together and encamped in Gilead, and the children of Israel assembled together and encamped at Mizpah. And the people, the leaders of Gilead, said to one another, Who is the man who will begin the fight against the people of Ammon. He shall be head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. So they're looking for the answer to who is going to begin this campaign against the Ammonites. And it's kind of interesting, because if you remember, we have Jair, the person who was in this region. And when he died, he had 30 sons who rode on 30 donkeys who lived in 30 towns. This is right here in Gilead. 
So do we have one of the descendants of Jair? Somebody who has modeled that example of leadership and fortitude to be a deliverer of Israel? The answer is no. One of these 30? No. They, they might, I mean, for all we know, these are, um, these are uh, spoiled brats. We don't know what becomes of them. We don't ever see them again regarding any of the convictions or deliverance of Israel. They have their towns and they have a nice ride, but they might just be trust fund babies. So they're not doing anything here. And they're looking for a person who is going to answer this call to deliver them. And so we enter into Judges chapter 11, verse 1. This is our introduction to our friend Jephthah. It says, now Jephthah the Gileadite was a mighty man of valor. You're going to notice we have some overlapping themes with this story of Jephthah as we have in the past with some other judges. Now the last time I heard the phrase mighty man of valor was my friend Gideon who was hiding out in a wine press. Now we have Jephthah who's introduced as this but he was the son of a harlot. And Gilead begot Jephthah. That was his father. His mother is not an Israelite. And his mother is a prostitute. Gilead's wife bore sons. And when his wife's sons grew up, they drove Jephthah out. And he said to them, you shall have no inheritance in our father's house. For you are the son of another woman. In fact, in the King James, it doesn't say another woman. It says a strange woman. And this reference to strange is foreign, someone that is not of us. This is, it's a little bit similar right off the bat to, to as I was reading this, I, I find it to be similar to Ishmael. You know, Ishmael was this illegitimate child that was not supposed to receive the inheritance and so, instead of taking care of this human being, Ishmael is sent out. Ishmael is left for dead, basically. But not with the Lord. The Lord hears the cries. The Lord answers. And that's the same for a little boy who's dying in a bush as it is for, uh, whether we're talking Israel or we're talking a person like Jephthah who really is different. Jephthah is a person who's rejected. They put Jephthah off just like we saw in chapter 10, Israel putting off God. They rejected God. They re rejected Jephthah. There's no one inheritance. Jephthah has no people. He's got no family. He's not living with his dad, and it doesn't say he lives with his mom. He is a rough and a heedless man who is rash and sometimes heartless. So this is the introduction of this man, Jephthah. It says in verse 3, Jephthah fled from his brothers and dwelt in the land of Tob, and worthless men banded together with Jephthah and went out raiding with him. This is another... Similar phrase here, worthless men. Because if you remember with Abimelech, that first illegitimate king, he surrounded himself with these kind of men, worthless men. This is a word that means empty and vain. So there just isn't substance here. And vanity is like without point. There's no point to their actions and their life and what they're doing. But really what we end up seeing with Jephthah, is we see the same thing then that we see now. This is just straight up the result of a broken home. We have nothing new under the sun. There's prostitution. There's families that reject other people and families. And so they reject their own kin, their own flesh and blood. And it leads people to find a way to make it on their own. And I'm just going to say today, we, we have this problem 
very, very, very significantly when it comes to uh, whether we're talking inner city or really not inner city. Uh, I was looking up a lot of information on gang violence and just gangs in general and stuff. Um, 41% of gangs exist in large cities. That's less than half. The next largest area is in the suburbs. And then the next largest area to that are small cities. So the vast majority of gangs, while there's a tremendous amount that exist in cities, they're not all in cities. They're all over the place. There's over 30,000 gangs in our country today. So when you have a young man that's being pursued by older men who have things that seem to give them worth and value, and they don't feel like they have any worth and value. Over 40% of homes in America do not have a father figure. Over 40%. So with that lack of direction, with that lack of love, with the lack of discipline, it's really wrecked havoc. It's, it's, it's wrecked people's lives. It's, it's wrecked the lives of young people. But I will say this about gangs. Uh, Francis Chan was doing a video on baptism, and he was talking about uh, this gangbanger that got saved in their church. And this guy wanted to get baptized, and it was so excited. He goes out there, and he's all tatted up and everything, and he gives his life to the Lord, and they dunk him, and he comes up, and people are just going crazy. He's on fire for God, but after a little while, they stopped seeing him. So somebody went in to check in on their friend and just went to where he lived, knocked on the apartment, and said, hey, we, we haven't seen you in a while. How you been? And he goes, oh, you know, I, I made a mistake. He said, you know, when I got involved in a gang, it started off, I got jumped, everyone beat me, and it was terrible. But then when it was over, they picked me up and we were family. And we did everything together. We lived together. We stayed together. We would die for each other. And I thought that when I got baptized, it was going to be like that in the church. And as he's explaining it, I mean, the answer is, no, you didn't get anything wrong. We got it wrong. In the same way that we have problems in our country with families and young men, especially with violence and influences that lead people into darkness. I mean, we have a church. We have people who walk through our doors more than once a week for us to have opportunities to, to hear and to love and to, to help. It's, I, I think it's an extremely important part of the story because Jephthah is a he's a gang leader. That's all Jephthah is. He's a tough gangbanger. And that toughness comes into play later on. And it's amazing how God is going to use a gangbanger like Jephthah. It's amazing how God's going to use anyone. But I mean, for us, it's like almost more incredible when you've had a tougher background or a harder life or something like that. God's ready to do the incredible and the impossible. So we see a person like Gideon who is probably like, you know, probably a good Israelite, a good Benjamite. Jephthah has no, he's got no legacy. He's got no reputation. This guy's got nothing going for him. And that's exactly why the Lord wants to use him. It's not that we have anything to offer God. God wants to show himself in the least of these. So yeah, let's take a person who's tatted up. Let's take a person who's really rough around the edges like Jephthah. Verse four says, it came to pass after a time that the people of Ammon made war against Israel. And so it was when the people of Ammon made war against Israel that the elders of Gilead went to get Jephthah from the land of Tob. Then they said to Jephthah, come be our commander that we may fight against the people of Ammon. And I got to think that Jephthah at this point probably feels a lot like the Lord kind of feels. He says, did you not hate me and expel me from my father's house? Why have you come to me now when you are in distress? 
And the elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, That is why we have turned again to you now, that you may go with us and fight against the people of Ammon and be our head over the inhabitants of Gilead. This is a very convenient place for them because, like I said, he's a tough guy. Um, he's, he's a raider, a warlord, or whatever. He's a tough guy. And when you're getting bullied around and everything like that, and you don't have a great relationship with God and everybody's afraid to go down and do something, Maybe you find the guy who was kind of like the boy named Sue, where he went through everything in life. He had nothing handed to him. It was a very, very tough life, but it was just the thing that would prepare you to have this steel in your soul when no one else does. God knows what he's doing. He knows what he's doing in very difficult situations and tough lives. And this is just the right man. For this time. And the elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, The Lord will be witness between us if we do not do according to your words. So God raises up. These guys were high society in Gilead, but it says in Luke 152 that he put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. And in Isaiah 55, 8, it says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. Then Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead, and the people made him head and commander over them. And Jephthah spoke all the words before the Lord at Mizpah. I, I want to highlight that last part right there, because we don't have too many indicators as to what Jephthah's relationship with the Lord is. In fact, this is one of the only ones that we have. So we have some judges where it's like, man, that guy was kind of a dirtbag. Um, we have some judges where it's like, wow, that person had great, great faith and had a great relationship with God. But Jephthah is kind of a bit of a wild card. Like I said, rough around the edges, but it's interesting. He goes to Mizpah and he declares all these words, his intentions before the Lord. And what we see is Jephthah takes his intentions and his words very seriously. And that's going to be a major theme with Jephthah tonight. It is also interesting that the elders, that he doesn't make the elders speak their words before the Lord. You know, kind of like, hey, you made this agreement, you speak before the Lord, let's kind of, let's get this in writing sort of a thing. He doesn't do that. He doesn't hold them accountable. He steps up to the plate and it's just him and God as far as accountability goes. And, and this is, I, this is actually an incredible example in a relationship with God. Others might drop the ball, and other people might not be good for their word. doesn't matter. When, when we commit to something or, or whatever it is that we do commit ourselves to, that's between us and the Lord. And though everyone else might have different standards or go wishy-washy and whatever, like Jephthah's a great example of, I'm going to do what I say, and this is going to be between me and God. So we're going to move really quickly right here. Jephthah sent messengers to the king of the people of Ammon, saying, this is verse 12, What do you have against me that you have come to fight against me in my land? The king of the people of Ammon answered, and messengers sent to Jephthah, because Israel took away my land when they came up out of Egypt from Arnon as far as the Jabbok and to the Jordan. Now, therefore, restore to us those lands peaceably. Basically, nothing new in Israel at all. Like, you're in our land, give it back. This is Israel 101. So this is going on at this time. I, I just want to say this. The people of Ammon, we haven't really heard too much in the book of Judges. They start to realize there is a vacuum in the powerful Gentile nations as some of them are being destroyed through some of the battles that we have with Israel. So they start moving in on those lands. And that's what we're going to get to here. Verse 14 says, So Jephthah again sent messengers to the king of the people of Ammon and said to him, Thus says Jephthah, Israel did not take away the land of Moab, nor the land of the people of Ammon. For when Israel came up from Egypt, they walked through the wilderness as far as the Red Sea and came to Kadesh. Then Israel sent messengers to the king of Edom saying, Please, yep, it says please. Please let me pass through your land. But the king of Edom would not heed. And in like manner, they sent to the king of Moab, but he would not consent. So Israel remained in Kadesh. And they went along through the wilderness and bypassed the land of Edom and the land of Moab. 
um, land of Yemen, came to the east side of the land of Moab and encamped on the other side of the Arnon. But they did not enter the border of Moab, for the Arnon was the border of Moab. Then Israel sent messengers to Sion, king of the Amorites, king of Heshbon, and Israel said to him, please let us pass through your land into our place. But Sion did not trust Israel to pass through his territory, so Sion gathered all his people together and camped in Jehaz and fought against Israel. And the Lord God of Israel delivered Sion and all his people into the hand of Israel, and they defeated them. Thus Israel gained possession of all the land of the Amorites who inhabited that country. So we're talking about Amorites and that land. Here's how it went down. Here's how we ended up getting it. They took possession of all the territory of the Amorites from the Arnon to the Jabbok and from the wilderness to the Jordan. Then Jephthah kicks it up a notch. So we're in verse 23 now. Now the Lord God of Israel has disposed the Amorites from before his people Israel. Should you then possess it? Basically, he's saying like, this was their land, not your land. We had this battle. You're supposed to be the one who possesses it. You're the victor of this. You get the land from the battle that had nothing to do with you guys. Verse 24, will you not possess whatever Chemosh your God gives you to possess? So he's using Israeli terms in the sense of like, our God gives us land. Our God provides for us places, territories, and victories. What's, what's your God doing? So whatever the Lord, our God, takes possession of before us, we will possess. So this is a negotiation kind of conversation. There's a little bit of reasoning going on here, but he's also putting his foot down, letting him know that, listen, <laughs> we serve the Lord. And if the Lord gives us land, that's what we're going to have. That's what we're going to possess. He's not apologizing for it. Verse 25. Now, are any of you better than Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab? Did he ever strive against Israel? Did he ever fight against them? While Israel dwelt in Heshbon and its villages in Eror and its villages and all its cities along the banks of Arnon, 300 years, why did you not recover them within that time. Therefore, I have not sinned against you, but you wronged me by fighting against me. May the Lord, the judge, render judgment this day between the children of Israel and the people of Ammon. However, the king of the people of Ammon did not heed the words which Jephthah sent him. So we understand the context of all the stuff that's going on. Israel is not trying to take land that's not theirs. He explains how the battles went down, how they acquired the land, and, and basically the, the moves that Ammon's doing to try to take it over. All right, verse 29. This is where things change a lot. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah, and he passed through Gilead and Manasseh, and passed through Mizpah of Gilead. And from Mizpah of Gilead, he advanced towards the people of Ammon. So once the Spirit of the Lord comes upon now he's moving freely throughout all these different areas that he was once rejected. These areas where he was not allowed to associate. Remember, he had to move out of Gilead up to Tob. And he was by himself up there without anyone except for this group of worthless men. But now he's starting to amass people and move into a battle position. And verse 30 says, Jephthah made a vow to the Lord and said... If you will indeed deliver the people of Ammon into my hands, then it will be that whatever comes out of the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the people of Ammon shall surely be the Lord's, and I will offer it as a burnt offering. Okay, now, I want to repeat that last verse, verse 31, with a little bit of a clarification on some of the Hebrew. I know. You're probably thinking, when did you become a Hebrew scholar? I'm not, but I did a lot of research on this, and I also made a phone call to a Hebrew scholar. So what was explained to me is, then it will be that whoever comes, when he comes from the doors of my house to meet me, when I return in peace from the people of Ammon, shall surely be the Lord's. This whomever shall be the Lord's, and I will offer him up as a burnt offering. Now, one of the important things that was told to me by my friend is 
there was a very intentional use of the masculine form for these words. So Jephthah is talking about a human being. And not just talking about a human being, but he's talking about some guy. And Jephthah probably had, who knows how many servants, who knows how many of these thugs and whatever that might crash at his house and whatever else. But he says, whoever, Jephthah, I I, want to mention this, Jephthah is in this Canaanite land. And this Canaanite land is uh, is a little bit complicated. It, Augustine has this to say. He did not vow in these words that he would offer some sheep, which he might present as a burnt offering according to the law, for it is not and was not a customary thing for a sheep to come out to meet a victorious general from returning from a war. Nor did he say, I will offer as a burnt offering whatever shall come out of the doors of my house to meet me. But he says, whoever comes out, I will offer him. And that him part is very important. So that there can be no doubt, whatever, that he had a human being in mind. In the New Living Translation, in Proverbs chapter 15, it says, Foolishness brings joy to those with no sense, A sensible person stays on the right path. Plans go wrong for lack of advice. Many advisors bring success. Now, why did Jephthah make the vow? I think that Jephthah is a zealous man. And again, I think he's a person who is very much influenced from a dark area of Canaan. Remember that map that we had, Israel was over on the west side. And east of the Jordan is a much different story. Um, There's a lot of culture there, especially when it comes to human sacrifice. And I think that Jephthah is just trying to be as intentional as possible with the task that's before him. So, verse 32, Jephthah advanced towards the people of Ammon to fight against them, and the Lord delivered them into his hands, and he defeated them at Aror as far as Minith, 20 cities, and to Abel Karamim, with a very great slaughter. Thus the people of Ammon were subdued before the children of Israel. And that's it. The whole battle is two verses. All of this story, the conclusion is very swift and very definite. So verse 34, when Jephthah came to his house at Mizpah, there was his daughter coming out to meet him with timbrels dancing, and she was his only child. Besides her, he had neither son nor daughter. So, did you get that part where when he came home out of his house comes his daughter? This is his only child, and, and I think we can tell from the next verse that she's very important to Jephthah and she's loved by Jephthah. It says, it came to pass when he saw her that he tore his clothes and he said, alas, my daughter, you have brought me very low. You are among those who trouble me for I have given my word to the Lord and I cannot go back on it. So, He's gravely concerned because of his love for his daughter. Remember, he's using masculine terms with the vow because in his mind, he's not thinking this is going to be my daughter. I mean, the question is, what were you thinking? What were you thinking making a vow like that in the first place? That's really the elephant in the room of this whole chapter. And I think really what this kind of comes down to is when we make a misguided attempt to worship God, when we of ourselves have something that's misguided in our understanding of our interaction with God or promises to God or devotion to God, for any of us who have not been Christians for the past five minutes, but maybe five years or 25 years, um, we know that we've made some 
mistakes along the way. And, and I referenced, I don't remember what teaching was, but I was a young, young, young man, in seventh grade or something like that, and uh, I was listening to the NHL playoffs on the radio because I didn't have cable, and I prayed to God, if you would just let my team win that I want to win, I will never ask you anything again. Somebody actually called me up at the church later that week and said, hey, you never told us if the team won, and I won't because it's not important. But that's a very foolish thing. It's a very foolish vow. I think what would be even more foolish, okay, because we make mistakes, what would be more foolish is feeling as though I needed to honor a foolish vow. Does that make sense? We make a mistake, but then when we have a chance to like look at the mistake and think about what we said we were going to do, and we look at maybe just a little bit of reality, and then we also have a, a very healthy dose of God kind of correcting us, Swallow the pride. Let it go. Be wrong. It's better than the alternative. It's better than having to go forward with what you said you were going to do that you never should have committed to because it wasn't of God in the first place ever, ever, ever. And it came to pass when he saw her that he tore his clothes. Okay, we covered that. I do want to say this about him. Jephthah kind of suffered a little bit from being too black and white. And I, I'm kind of a black and white person too. I, I'm not trying to be legalistic. I'm, I'm, I'm really not legalistic, but I just like things to be easy. I just like to know what you should do and what you shouldn't do, you know? I, I like things to be as straightforward as possible. And Jephthah, pretty black and white person, um, He's got some good qualities that we shouldn't overlook. It says he was remarkable for two great qualities. He depended for everything on God. He dedicated everything to God. I mean, if you think about it, like his vow was a pretty crazy one. I'll, Lord, whatever, whatever comes out of my house is yours. I'm going to burn it up for you. His heart was zealous but zeal without wisdom is folly. Jephthah was willing, according to his might, to give up to God the dearest object of his heart. Now, one thing I do want to point out to you guys, I have Judges 11.29 up on the screen because it says, then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah and he passed through Gilead and Manasseh and passed through Mizpah and so on and so forth. But, it's verse 29 that says that the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. Verse 30 is when he makes the vow. He wasn't lacking God. He wasn't lacking the power of God. But this is, I mean, to talk about a cautionary tale, this is such a wake-up call that we can be empowered by the Holy Spirit. We can know God and for have to have God come upon us and still be very, very misguided. To the point where, I mean, that's basically the main focus of this whole chapter. Remember, the battle is two, two verses and doesn't even give any details. It's just so over. The Lord was going to deliver this battle into Jephthah's hand without the vow. That's why the Holy Spirit came upon him in the first place. The vow had nothing to do with it. It had something to do with his own intention to devote himself to God, but wrongly. And I think there's something to be grasped there. We can devote ourselves to God in ways that are not healthy and not good. And this is exactly what Jephthah is doing here. It's not that he, he didn't take the Lord seriously and his devotion to the Lord seriously, very, very, very much so, the opposite degree to a fault. Remember earlier, Isaiah 55, 8, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways. It's a scary thought when that's also talking about the person that God is choosing and raising up and empowering. They may not always be following God with everything that they're doing. They may not always be thinking the ways of God. Verse 36 
So she said to him, my father, if you have given your word to the Lord, do to me according to what has gone out of your mouth, because the Lord has avenged you to your enemies, the people of Ammon. Now the child's outlook and attitude and obedience is remarkable. It's really amazing. Um, this is not your average young lady. And it's understandable to see how important this person was for Jephthah. I mean, she basically just says, Dad, whatever it is, you can count on me. She has no idea what she's agreeing to, but it doesn't matter. She loves her father, she's loyal to her father, and she knows that the Lord has delivered to her father this great victory. Then she said to her father, let this thing be done for me. Let me alone for two months that I may go and wander on the mountains and bewail my virginity for my friends and I. So he said, go. And he sent her away for two months and she went with her friends and bewailed her virginity on the mountains. And it was so at the end of the two months that she returned to her father and he carried out his vow with her, which he had vowed. She knew no man, and it became a custom in Israel that the daughters of Israel went four days each year to lament the daughter of Jephthah the Gileadite. So what happened? Did this really happen? There's two main theories on this. The one theory is If it was going to be an animal, it would be a burnt offering. If it was not going to be an animal, it would be an offering unto the Lord. So a person would be dedicated to the service of the Lord, remain unmarried, and serve the Lord at the temple or some kind of local tabernacle. And there's some reasons why that would make sense. I mean, Jephthah was, to some degree, a godly man. And Jephthah was a person that would have to come to his senses, right? I mean, he wouldn't go through with something like this, right? When I was talking to Pastor Ken before about this, Pastor Ken said, I, you know, if he, if he did that, if he actually did sacrifice his daughter, I would, I would think that somewhere else in Scripture would be like referencing it. Again, that cautionary tale. But he did this, you know, like, you know, a certain king was good and they did this, but then they also did this. And that could be true. I know that there are other judges where there are good things that are done and then there are bad things that are done, but history remembers the good ones. Like in Hebrews chapter 11, you know, Barak is not called a um, person lacking faithfulness and Gideon is not referred to as a person who set up a, a worship of Baal. Well, Jephthah is also in Hebrews 11. And it doesn't say Jephthah, sacrificer of his daughter. Okay, I mean, that's legitimate. And there's a number of legitimate reasons to think that he didn't sacrifice his daughter. After it goes to, um, uh, I forget which verse specifically, but it starts to then just talk about her virginity. And it talks about like that being the thing that she's like going to lament with her friends. You know, she's going to go out and she's going to have this time where she's lamenting the fact that she's never going to marry in her life. So it says after that, after he carried out his vow, that the daughters of Israel went four days each year to lament the daughter of Jephthah. You know, lamenting her faithfulness and virginity and stuff. But, you know, one of the interesting things is it doesn't say they went to go visit her doesn't say that. Chuck Smith said, now number one, God has had forbid human sacrifice. There is a question of whether or not he actually killed her. The burnt offering sacrifice was actually a sacrifice of consecration unto God. And there are some commentators who teach that he gave her to God to perpetual virginity. In other words, to keep her from ever marrying and she was consigned to a life of celibacy because of the vow her father had made. That is possible. It isn't probable, but it is possible. From the apparent reading of the text, he did this awful thing. 
and actually sacrificed his daughter unto the Lord. There are people that are on both sides. Um, it does say in verse 39, and he carried out his vow with her, which he had vowed. The thing is, it's such a horrific idea. I, I remember the first time I read this and I grabbed that phone so fast that was on my desk, and I called Pastor Ken, and I was like, what is going on with this? Because this was one of those, this, I mean, there's a lot of bad things that happen, but there's some things that are so, I, I don't, perverse might be the right word here. I, it's just horrific that I could not imagine that this is what it was talking about. But I just want to say, it is possible that this is what it's talking about. I'm just going to move really quickly in the beginning of verse 12. Uh, I am out of time, but if I had time, this is what I would teach. Then the men of Ephraim gathered together, crossed over towards Zaphon, and he said to Jephthah, Why did you cross over to fight against the people of Ammon and not call us to go with you? We will burn your house down with fire. And Jephthah said to them, My people and I were in a great struggle with the people of Ammon, and when I called you, you did not deliver me out of their hands. So when I saw that you would not deliver me, I took my life in my hands, crossed over against the people of Ammon, and the Lord delivered them into my hand. Why then have you come up to me this day to fight against me? Now Jephthah gathered together all the men of Gilead and fought against Ephraim. And the men of Gilead defeated Ephraim because they said, You Gileadites, Gileadites are fugitives of Ephraim among the Ephraimites and among the Manassites. This is the first civil war that takes place in Israel. This just happened. In fact, in the story of Gideon, there's almost one, and Gideon uses some very gentle language and subdues the conflict. And Jephthah does not. Remember, he sticks to his guns. And so this starts, and they go to war. This is the first war within Israel. The Gileadites seized the fords of the Jordan before the Ephraimites arrived, and when any Ephraimite who escaped said, let me cross over, the men of Gilead would say to them, are you an Ephraimite? If he said no, then they would say to him, then say Shibboleth. And he would say, Sibboleth, for he could not pronounce it right. This is almost like kind of like a Monty Python scene, like at a bridge or something like that, where they're, you know, you can almost like, kind of hear like the Knights of Neat, like saying it in a high voice and stuff. For he could not pronounce it. Then they would take him and kill him at the fords of the Jordan. There fell at that time 42,000 Ephraimites. And Jephthah judged Israel six years. Then Jephthah the Gileadite died and was buried among the cities of Gilead. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that your grace does not run out when we let you down. Thank you that the only son that was ever needing to ever be sacrificed was not Isaac, it wasn't the daughter of Jephthah, but you gave everything for us. We've been purchased by the blood of the Lamb, who is our judge, who is our king, who is our friend and our redeemer, our shepherd. Lord, help us in our misguidedness, no matter how sure our heart might be, even when we have the power of your spirit upon us, that we would not be misguided, that we would not be prideful or, or uh, without the wisdom that you have afforded to us. Help us to teach and raise our children and nurture them in love, not reject and, and not and, and for them to not be our own sacrifices in whatever capacity. That we would sacrifice them for our own gain or for our own promises or anything else. And to the Lord, thank you for your deliverance. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Okay. If there's no questions, this question.